as we break into this, what I would call this list of champions of the faith, let the Holy Spirit have its work. Compare yourselves to these men. This is the time for us to get humbled. You know, I think of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians in, in, in chapter 10. He comes against the foolish men, men who he calls who are unwise. And do you know why he says they're unwise? He says because they measure themselves by themselves. In other words, they're looking to say, hey, you know, how do I know if I'm really a good person? They look in the mirror. I think I'm a pretty good guy. I don't do so bad. I go to church regularly. I believe in Jesus. That's not the measuring rod. We're about to experience the measuring rod. You want to compare yourself to men? The men we're going to go through, these are the men you do that with. And then let me know how you feel. Let's continue. But before we do, we're going to do a, a, one last bit of preparation so that I feel, or at least I'm encouraged by the fact that before we get into chapter 11, we feel the weight of what we're getting ourselves into. And so I actually want to begin today by taking you to Ezekiel. And I want to go to chapter 14. Let's go verse 13. Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off the supply of bread and send famine on it and cut off man and beast from it. Know this, this is a promise. If this nation, if America continues to sin by persistent unfaithfulness, no, the sword, the famine, and the pestilence will be here. That, this is a biblical promise. The nation that turns its back on God is going to face God's wrath. We continue on. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Absolutely amazing. The Lord himself employs this literary structure that the writer of Hebrews does in a, in a much more condensed version, the same principle applying. He brings these righteous men before you and says, the only people that are gonna survive my wrath are these guys. It gets scarier. I didn't put this up here, but if you actually read the passage, it talks about even if they had sons and daughters, they're not gonna make it. They're not at that level where they're operating in faith like they are, Noah, Daniel, and Job, you're not getting in. This is why I get scared when we distance ourselves from men like these and look at them as superheroes, which uh, as fictional superheroes, if you will, unattainable. No, it's what we're called to. But we don't want to think like that. You know why? Because we don't want to sacrifice the love for the world. We don't. And so we distance ourselves from it, and that scares me to death. But this needs to be brought to the table here and now. If we're going to go through Hebrews 11, it needs to hit its mark, and you need to feel the weight of what he's doing. He's dropping all of us right to our knees. With that said, let's break into Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. This begins the list of these champions of the faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. How does Abel offer this incredible sacrifice that is more acceptable than Cain? It's greater than Cain's offering. How does he do this? And the writer tells us it's by faith. This is how he does it. It's by faith. One thing that we're going to realize today is this. Faith is not a concept. This is so critical as we go through Romans 11. It's not simply an idea, a thought that I have in my head. Oh, you know what? I have this concept. Oh, I believe. Oh, no, 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 no. What the writer is laying out, it's way deeper than that. We need to have his biblical understanding of what true faith is. So I'm going to tell you, you have the faith of Abel. You know what it will do? It will drive you to the word of God. You will have a burning passion. It will drive you to prayer. Because if you're not praying, I'm telling you, you're not a man of faith. You have conceptual belief. You may go to church every week. You may talk about Jesus when you want. You may spend time in the word even when you want. But true faith, 
You can't stop it. It's overwhelming. You can't contain it. You can't deny it. It drives you to the word. It drives you to prayer. It drives you to obedience. It drives you to forgiveness. And I'm gonna tell you something. Your flesh will not allow you to forgive anyone. It's not in its nature. Only true faith can overcome that. See, because true faith actually believes what Yeshua said in Matthew 6, when he said, unless you forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. It takes faith. And if I believe that statement, that's what gives me the strength to overcome my flesh, which is trying to justify my bitterness and my anger towards somebody who has sinned against me to cling on to that. And your flesh will only manifest that. It will manifest it. It will keep urging. It will never let you go. It'll keep giving you reason after reason to get angry and angry and angry. And only faith, only faith can come and say, I believe what Yeshua said. I'm gonna work this out. Now, that being said, I wanna take you back to the story of Cain and Abel because what we're gonna do is as we, as we navigate this chapter 11 and he keeps bringing these one champion out after another, we're gonna get a little backdrop to this. This is gonna give you a better perspective, a better understanding of where the writer is coming from, how he can make all these statements. He keeps taking it back to faith. Well, as we look at these stories, well, we're gonna to start to develop an understanding, a biblical understanding, what is faith? What does that really look like? And so let's go to Genesis 4. We'll begin at verse 1. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I'm not so inclined to presuppose that either of these men's characters should be defined by their occupation. I, I, I think that's really dangerous. And, and I, I make this statement because of conversations that I've had because of questions that I get, uh, whether in person or online, uh, and even conversations that you, you hear even amongst uh, pastors and even at a scholarly level, that, oh, we know the problem here. I know why Abel is accepted and why Cain wasn't. It was because Abel was a shepherd and we can read through scriptures. We see all these wonderful men who are shepherds and therefore that, that makes a lot of sense. And you know what, Cain is a filthy tiller of the ground. This totally makes sense because of his vocation or his occupation. This is why he's so evil. That is not it. That is, that is not it at all. Actually, as we dig deeper into this, you're gonna see this. And, and let me mention this. Noah was a tiller of the ground. Noah was a farmer. Last time I checked, and we're going to see this next week, Noah's righteous. All right, with that said, let's continue on. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, I ask the question here, why does God respect Abel in his offering and not Cain? Why is this? Is, 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 is it because of their occupation, because he was a shepherd and because he was a tiller of the ground? Well, that's why I'm accepting Abel and rejecting you. Or perhaps one of the other arguments is like, well, no, 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 no. It's, it's because Abel offered something of more value. He offered something alive that had to be killed, whereas Cain, oh, no, no, no. Cain offered something dead, and therefore, it was less valuable. What is it? How do, how do we determine what's going on here? Because as we start to peel this back, we're going to start to understand where this writer of Hebrews is coming from and what faith really is, what it looks like. I want to bring some extra biblical commentary into the mix. I want to look at what is going on here. I want to understand why is God accepting Abel and not Cain? And the first place I want to take you is known as Genesis Rabbah. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with this, this is some Jewish rabbinical commentary that hails from the classical period. You're talking third, fourth century, roughly in there. And the rabbis comment on this very thing. They comment on this story. And listen to what they say. This is amazing. In Cain, meaning Cain, brought from the fruit of the land an offering to God from the leftovers. 
Similar to the evil tenant that eats the first fruits and gives to the owner of the field the stunted ones. And Hevel, which is say Abel, brought also he from the firstborn of his sheep and their fat. So the rabbis, and looking at the story, peel back a layer and tell us, here's the problem. Here's what he did. He didn't give his first and best. He gave God the leftovers. Well, do you know there actually seems to be a biblical precedent from where the rabbis are coming from here? If you go to the Greek Septuagint, and, and let me be clear, this writer in Hebrews, as he starts navigating through the entire book, and very much so in chapter 11, as he's going through, do you know what he's drawing from? You know what the Bible he's drawing from? He's looking at? It's the Greek Septuagint. Specifically, we'll look at that more in more detail later. But I want to take you what the writer's actually looking at. And I want to show you something, and it's going to lend some credence to what the rabbis have said here. In the Septuagint, we read this, the very passage. The Lord God said to Cain, To what end have you become deeply grieved? And to what end has your face fallen? Have you not sinned if you offer rightly, but do not divide rightly? Unbelievable. In other words, God says something here so incredibly important is that you did, you came rightly. You came with the offering. What you're doing is right. You divided it wrong. Cain didn't give his first and his best. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor. Hit the like button. Don't forget to hit the share. And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you want to watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you want to watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your Play Stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.